Hello, welcome to Emotional Badass, where Moxie meets Mindful. I'm Nikki Eisenhower, your host, life coach, and psychotherapist. And on today's episode, I'm discussing the big question, children or child-free? One of, if not the biggest questions of our lives, is whether or not to have children. Few topics are as complicated as this one. In this episode, I'm attempting to scratch the surface of this deep, deep, deep question that we all face. I'm going to shoot this through the lens of a progression. Recently, I did an episode on Patreon about my progression through my relationship with food. And y'all gave me feedback that you really liked that, that being able to see that progression in my life helped you see some progression in your relationship with food. So I'm here to share my progression through this issue of whether or not to become a mother whether or not to become a parent, to bring children into the world. First, I need to say to you that no one can make this decision for you. Only you can make this decision to be a parent or not. A child is really a co-creation with the universe. What I mean by that is, We don't get to fully decide the moment we're going to have a child or if and when we can get pregnant or if we're male, if or when we can create a child with a woman. Our life in so many ways isn't just what we intend of it. It is this co-creation of what we intend and how the universe unfolds, where it meets us. What I suggest on this big topic, just like all the life topics, everything that we're dealing with and learning about, is to get to know yourself. And that means getting to know your strengths, your own limitations, your priorities, your morals, your values, your beliefs, and thinking about what you really want out of life, what experience you want to have in this one precious life. And for you women out there, who are approaching or at 33 or a little bit older, I'll be 42 this year, the internet also starts to stalk you about getting older. It scares you about fertility and aging. This is a new added and weird stressor on top of our societal and cultural and familial pressures to procreate. Take what you will from me sharing my story. And just like always, take what works for you and leave the rest. I share because I believe we learn the most naturally from sharing our experiences, even when our experiences are very different. There are some journal questions at the end of this episode if you want to take this topic further. So here is my progression. I'm the eldest of three girls, and I adored being a big sister. I very much embodied more of a little mother than a big sister. I love teaching them and holding them. And I mean, I'm on this mic teaching right this very second. So I I have this teacher spirit, just like I do today. I had when I was a little girl. And I love teaching little ones new things. I love seeing the wonder in their faces and in their spirits. That sweet little giggle that comes over a child who discovers something brand new. I love changing diapers. I love checking on them in the middle of the night. I helped soothe their boo-boos. In my bigger extended family, I was the third eldest out of 16 grandchildren. Two were older than me, a boy and a girl, but they were mostly disinterested in the other younger children in a way that I think is more typical than how I was. I was a natural caretaker. I got a lot of joy out of caretaking the little ones. I was often left in charge. I would take five to 12 kids very regularly to the beach. I spent every summer of my life on the coast of Mississippi and Bay St. Louis, a block from the beach. I loved this responsibility. 
I loved being able to naturally manage all of these kids. As lost as I was because of family chaos, my father abandoning, my parents having a tumultuous divorce, losing our family home, living with my grandparents, I had a profound confidence in my ability to manage children. The simplest way for me to describe it is if you've ever seen Joe Frost, who's super nanny. There are some of us that are born in this world who have an intuitive sense of how to be with children in such a way. I very much knew a lot of what she embodies naturally. There's a balance of holding a strong strength around children to help them feel safe and secure, boundaried, disciplined. One that's firm and loving, but balanced with encouragement, excitement, wonder, glee. I knew how to do this with children. My first business was as a babysitter. And just like my therapy business so many years later, I'm proud to say that I turned people away very quickly because I filled up. People could feel that I really, really cared for their children when I was with them. I'm a natural mother goose in this way. Lost children find me, used to find me when I was a teenager in the mall. I've had a kid find me in the French Quarter who got separated from his parents. And some of you write in to thank me for being a spiritual mama, the way that I thank some of my spiritual parents in various ways on the show. At 12, I got my hands on a baby name book. And now this freaked out my parents. But I loved to write, loved it wrote poetry and short stories. And I used this book to find creativity about characters and names. But I also daydreamed about my future, about the family I would have, about the kind of parent I would be, about what my children would look like. And I began imagining that I'd have a big family, four to six kids. Much of what I heard growing up in southern Louisiana was a presupposition that would show up in people nonchalantly. They'd observe me holding their babies or small children, tending to someone who fell off a bike or started a fight, and I'd break it up. And they'd say, Nikki, when you have kids, you're going to be so good at being a mom. I got a lot of compliments. The people pleaser in me, the good girl, the obedient girl loved this validation. When you grow up and have kids, do you want a boy or a girl first, Nikki? I also heard the phrase, when you have kids, you'll understand. There was lots of expectation that the natural thing for me to do was have children. I didn't know an adult woman who didn't have children until I was working with Lisa Tahir as a young woman. I knew that I didn't want to recreate my mother's life as a teenager. She was pregnant with me in high school and was kicked out of Catholic high school because of it. And my super duper Catholic grandmother gave her two options to put me up for adoption or to get married. That's still the way that it was in 1980s in the South. I didn't know till I was an adult that my grandmother pushed her to put me up for adoption But she made the choice to marry my father and then went on to have both of my sisters. I became sexually active as a teenager at 16, but I was determined to never get pregnant until I was ready. This was something I promised myself. I was terrified about. I was hypervigilant about. I did not want to put a child through a messy divorce as I had been. And as I say that, of course, anyone who brings a child into the world who gets married, doesn't want to go through a divorce or put a child through a divorce. I'm saying that in this moment to say that I had a conscious awareness. I kept this at the forefront of my mind. This wasn't something that popped in and out. This was something that sat in the front of my mind constantly. I didn't want to recreate my mother's mistakes. I had just turned 18 when I started college And I met the man who would become my first husband. I was 24 
when I met the man who would become my second husband. Both of these men wanted to have children with me. I was the one who put on the brakes because it didn't ever feel right. I wasn't satisfied in those relationships. I wasn't satisfied with myself. I wasn't satisfied with the relationship. And I wasn't well matched with either of them. For a brief stint in both relationships, I went against my intuition and said, okay, and did try to get pregnant. Then differently, but similarly, in both marriages at different times in my life, something in me felt so uncomfortable, so uneasy that I said, no, this is not what I want. This is not right for me. And I ended both relationships. I was 35 when I ended my second marriage. I had thought this was the time in my life where I would finally be able to healthily, from a secure place, have a child and become a mother. I grieved like the pain was coming out of the center of my bones. The second divorce cut me wide open. I felt like Lieutenant Dan during the storm in Forrest Gump. People my age or older will know that reference. And if you're younger and you've never watched Forrest Gump, please go watch it. Lieutenant Dan screamed on that ship in the middle of open water, fought the sky, stormed and raged along with the boat thrashing in the storm. Lieutenant Dan had lost his legs and he was angry at God, angry at the universe, angry at life. I did the equivalent of raging at the universe from my first little historic Denver apartment. I was beyond angry. I was beyond hurt. I was beyond feeling like life was swimming upstream. I had tried so hard to position myself to make becoming a mother the next right thing. I was resentful at people who seemed to stumble into ease or stumble into stable relationships that seemed to trip into goodness, to know what it was to find a reliable partner, a compatible partner, a solid partnership, and be able to bring life on a solid ground into this world. I felt like a failure. I felt raw. Some nights I'd cry till my heart ached and I thought it might stop. Sometimes I wrote out my feelings till my hand hurt and I couldn't write anymore. I trusted by then that the universe was strong enough to handle my rage, that any real God that was out there could handle whatever I had to say, whatever I had to give, whatever I had to release out of my body. I had to, just like many of you out there who are facing your own struggles, your own pain, your own grief process to get to the other side. I had to go through blaming and feeling victimized to get to the other side, to be able to own all of my choices and own my healing. And that is the process, whether we like it or not, and whether we fight it or not. I had done enough work psychologically on myself by then to deeply comprehend what I was going through. I was intense and I felt intensely, but I was still grounded. I was never dangerous or self-harming. I knew it needed to leave me this pain. I was releasing pain, not just from that present moment, but from all of my life. I was releasing the old Southern naive promises that if I'm just a good girl, if I follow the rules, if I make good decisions and work hard, the things I want will come to me in good time. The second divorce seemed to knock loose any old grief from my childhood, from the loss of my parents in my life and everything that had to unfold between us for me to be no contact with all three of them to my siblings and extended family, how I made the choice to walk away, the married families I had tried so hard to assimilate into, that recreated childhood trauma by rejecting me when I was no longer their version of good, obedient girl. I was angry at the universe. I'd talk out loud to it 
and say things like, I waited till the right time and I still can't have this. Fuck you. And to be psychologically clear, that was just my pain talking, the grief talking. Anger comes up and out of us because it covers up the deep down ownership truth in all of us. No matter what the topic of the pain, it all boils down to our life is our responsibility. Our choices belong to us, each of us. Because anger is powerful and our pain is vulnerable, we go through the pain first as a top layer. As I move through the anger, the hurt, then I could see what I was working with. I could see that I was vulnerable. And it's by facing this vulnerability that we become set free. When we come from chaos, we recreate stress and chaos. We do what we know till we know something different, till we know better. My childhood abandonment wounds had me, just like many of you listening, mindlessly believing this dysfunctional programming that raised me, that told me that there was nothing better out there than dysfunctional relationships, or the best I knew how to do was a dysfunctional relationship, or that this was all there was so that I should just stay to avoid that feeling of losing another person. And this set me up to stay until I couldn't anymore and had to leave. This is a common behavior when we have abandonment wounds, to become overly loyal, not just to people, but to situations that keep us in status quo, that we choose sameness just because the unknown terrifies Even when all evidence says run from a relationship or run from a job or run from an organization, get out of there. This isn't where you're supposed to be. A trauma survivor can dig in instead of let go. This grief, this pain process, this facing myself, it had to pour out of my body. I knew how to stay with myself at 35. So I just let myself cry and weep, trusting that it would find its end. And it did. The storm clouds lifted after about four weeks and fully after about six weeks. And the sun started shining inside of me. The clouds dissipated. And through the pain, I could then consider my options about becoming a parent or not. I decided that I would sit for a solid month Four full weeks of not trying to figure anything else out, of allowing my only process to be that I could sit with this great intention that I could be a single mother to one or possibly two children, that I was going to sit with this idea and try this idea on for size. I had grown up in a time where feminism had told me and taught me that I had the right to pursue the family I wanted and I could create whatever I wanted with or without a man. So I sat with this idea. I sat with the idea that I could do it myself or I could find a partner. I could manifest him and have the family I'd always dreamed of since I was 12. I was still young enough to where I could have a few and if I wanted a big giant family, I could adopt a few. I just gave myself some time to just allow this idea to sit inside of me, to unfold for me to feel it. Because this is what I've come to know about myself, that I can't make a decision fully out of logic and I can't make a decision fully out of my gut. I must sit and feel through both of those ways of being, both of those tracks of wisdom That's what I need to do as Nikki the person to feel my way through. And I've seen this come together for other women because I believe that when it's our path, it unfolds for us. Part of this work was for me to come to terms with my spiritual belief and faith instead of holding on to an old story just to hold on to an old story. 
Spiritually, I knew and I trusted and I believed that if I was meant to be a mother, then it wasn't even really fully up to me. Then it would happen like a calling. I was talking to my girlfriend, who's been my sister since I was 18 years old, so more than half of my life now. And she said to me one day during this period, you know, you really were a mother. And I began to cry at the truth of what she was saying. I had been, despite my youth and despite my depression, very motherly to my siblings. And I had been a very present stepmother for my first husband's daughter. I met her at 15 months old. And the truth is, I probably fell in love with her more than I fell in love with him. And I didn't leave till she was eight years old. I had read to her every night I had her, taught her to swim. I volunteered at her school. I baked birthday cakes and we did crafts. I've shared a lot with you over this microphone. It was the hardest thing I've ever survived to leave her. I look back and realize I traumatized myself having to leave a child when I had been abandoned by a primary parent. My poor inner child was so confused and hurt. My stepchild, she had her primary bonds with her parents. I was a bonus parent. But the guilt and the pain of this loss was unlike anything else I've experienced. When my girlfriend said this to me, I felt something align in my body. A profound shift. Something settled as I cried and my crying was different. In that moment, I cried with relief instead of with pain. She was right. I had kissed boo-boos. I had soothed nightmares. I had painted clouds on her ceiling because I loved her. I had witnessed her go from baby to little girl. I even brought her to school with me, and she sat in my psychology classes for my first degree. In the way we can't do all of our work alone in isolation— I knew these things in my head and in my heart. But it was my friend who was pregnant at the time, about to become a mother herself, validating my experience that broke something loose inside of me. Something let go. Something let me be lighter. It was like a voice whispered to me. I don't have to have my own kids. I'm a nurturer. And that's not the only way to do it. I can nurture myself. I can nurture a relationship if that's what's right for me. And I can feel satisfied about how the mama goose nature of part of my personality has been able to experience love and care of so many sweet little children. I felt peace. In the next few months, I began to feel more peace and more joy, like I had never felt in my life. I was feeling security. I was taking care of myself in a brand new state. I didn't really know anybody here. I knew one person that was in Boulder. I'm in Denver. Before I came to Colorado, I went to improv and meditation group and yoga I walked every street of the city in my neighborhood, whether the sun shone or the snow fell down. I walked every park in Denver, and I let my inner child play in the snow. I felt free, and I felt at peace with my decision to be child-free. The truth is, it had always felt upstream, my desire to have kids, And in letting go, I felt that upstream struggle dissipate, and my body felt at ease. There were practical things that I considered that led me to choose child-free beyond that conversation with my friend. I considered if I really wanted to be one of those feminist women who do it all, and I had to admit to myself that I do one or two things really well, but doing it all didn't appeal to me. I didn't think that would be a good scenario for me to invite. Could I? Yes. 
Would I have been an imperfect and good enough mother? Yes. Practically, I thought about what it takes each day to give a child what they need to thrive. The time, the attention, the money, the private school, the patience, the pace of enrichment activities, daycare, keeping up with the laundry and cooking and cleaning and fun. I looked at the downtime I like and the downtime I need to feel and be balanced. The more I looked at my life and modern life, the more solidified an already solid decision to stay child-free became for me. Today at almost 42, I'm at peace. And peace does not mean I've settled on the consolation prize, y'all. I feel like I've won. I feel like I've won the lottery. Because I think that's how it feels when we figure out how to hone in on what honors our calling, our true authentic selves, our priorities, our drives, our morals, our values, our beliefs. I have no secret sadness, no regret. I made a decision somewhere along the way to give me and my inner child as much ease as possible and recognition of how much dis-ease she and I had been exposed to for all of our development. Now, I'm a hard worker. I'm not saying that life is easy or should be. I have big ambitions. I work very hard. I expect a lot out of myself. I have high standards. The balance is that I also want and work towards increasing ease and peace in my body, in my mind, and in my spirit. Everything about this feels like a massive yes to my heart and mind and body. And I have definitely known people who felt called to have children, and that brought them peace and ease in a way that's different than how I'm defining it for myself. That really is the dilemma that each of us face. What are we called to? Who are we? What are we doing with this one precious life? What feels right on a deep, connected, spiritual level? What allows us to expand in the ways that serve us in this life, that serve the world? We can dig deep when we're facing making this decision. And you're right. Some of us don't like making this decision. If we're in straight relationships, we can cross our fingers and let nature decide. Some people go that route. Some people decide that that's their right. We can ask ourselves, are we more of a planner? Are we more of someone who lets go, rolls the dice, and lets the universe decide? Now, if we're in a gay relationship, we don't have the luxury of having a potential oops if that's what we want. So it must be more intentional. If that's where you are, just know that it's really common, just like I talked about working through my frustration and anger, that if you want children and you're in a gay relationship, it takes more effort. It takes more intention. It often costs more money. You get to have all your feelings about that, too. My first interview was with Deja Osborne, the artist. I reference her cards all the time. And part of why I love that interview is because we didn't plan for it. But part of what came up is I had always planned to have children and had recently decided not to. And she had always decided she was going to be child free. And then she became pregnant and is the proud mom of a sweet little boy. We don't have perfect control over this life. When we think we do, we tend to feel a whole lot of anxiety because we're trying to control things that we might just not have the full power to control. Much in this life is a conscious choice, and much is the universe throwing organized chaos in our laps. If you've ever heard me say, we don't get to choose the lessons, this is what I mean. That consciously, I would have chosen to be a mom with a lot of ease earlier in my life. But the universe has co-created a different formulation, a different plan, a different recipe for my life. I've been guided to a different place. I hope this episode is an example on whatever topic 
that we can find peace and ease, acceptance and joy when we let go, when we see that there's wisdom in letting go. There are certainly times where the wisdom is to hang on. And that's what each of us is trying to figure out. To those who are scared to make this kind of decision to have children or not to have children and are scared to regret either way, I want to tell you that regretting is its own choice too. I choose with a whole lot of stubbornness to not allow regret as part of my process. Regret can be a sneaky victim mentality. I don't have to hold on to regret to what if I can be where I am with my choice, with my commitment to that choice. And I can also know from a place of wisdom that if there is a time when I have desire and space and a wish to fill it with love and care for a child, that there are so many creative ways for me to figure that out. I can become a big sister with the organization Big Sisters or Big Brothers. I can show up as an auntie figure or as a grandmotherly figure the older I get. I always have the option to be a foster parent. I can be in commitment to my choice that helps ground me now. I don't have to lock down on that in some kind of defensive posture. Whatever unfolds. I'm at peace with being child-free. Real deep peace right now. If you're struggling with this choice, I can encourage you to learn emotional boundaries. If you haven't taken my course, you can't sign up for it right this second, but we'll have sign up ready in about a month. But look for my boundaries course. I teach it every October. And my course and just even the idea of boundaries, warming up to that idea This will help you learn to respect the line, the boundary between your thoughts and others, between your thoughts and society, between your thoughts and desires and your family's thoughts and desires so that you can have more clarity about who you are, what you want, what you don't want. Being a good parent takes patience and generosity of spirit. It takes a backbone to stand firm and to teach them boundaries Get real with your strengths and your limitations. Spend some time, like I spent that month with myself deciding. Spend some time if you're considering becoming a parent. Going, what would I be good at? What might I need to strengthen? These are questions that are, that are big. You may just hear one that resonates with you, and that's plenty. How do you make big life decisions? How much do you value logic versus intuition? Do you do what's expected of you or do you have more of a rebellious spirit? How might that play into anything that you're trying to decide? How much does people pleasing still play into your decision making? What are good reasons to have children? Are you a planner or do you take leaps of faith? What do you sense Should current issues shape the decision to have children? Issues like global warming or inflation? Or even what happened to kids and parents through COVID? Are those or aren't those valid issues in the decision to become a parent? Are you willing to graciously spend your hard-earned money on a child and make sacrifices for a child? What are you scared of if you have children? What are you scared of if you don't? Is there a path that isn't scary in life? How much can you know for sure before you decide? Is it okay to change your mind? When is it okay to change your mind? Is it okay to reevaluate a long-held expectation? Do you feel or do people around you feel entitled to having children? What's that about? If you liked this episode and you want more or you're interested in checking out that episode I mentioned earlier about my progression through my relationship with food, come to Patreon. Just start hanging out. If y'all are interested in having a live stream Q&A on the topic of 
being child free. I am open to that. So come to Patreon and let me know. If you have children already and are at peace, awesome. If you have children and you aren't at peace, I hope there's something in this episode that helps you understand that your task is then to cultivate peace about the decisions your younger self made, the situations that may have been created, and to figure out how to come to peace. We can come to peace no matter our circumstance, no matter our former expectations, and no matter how intensely we feel in any way. These are the hard choices that we make to shape this one precious life. There's lots of ways to go about thinking about this. And I hope by me sharing, it helps you see your own story with more clarity. I hope this episode and everything that I put out there helps you hold yourself with a little more respect, self-love, head held high, owning who you are. I want to thank those of you who support the show by spending your precious minutes getting on iTunes and writing us a review. These reviews are not to stroke my ego, you guys. These five-star reviews are what help work that funky iTunes algorithm so that emotional badass is suggested to more and more and more people. Rarely does a day go by when this team doesn't receive a message that says, oh my goodness, I am just today realizing that I am a highly sensitive person. I feel unalone. Oh, it's getting me. And I don't feel crazy And they thank us for doing the show. When you write these reviews, it really, really helps other people find us. And it brings peace and clarity. Thank you for doing that. We cannot do that without you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank Alexi Nicole or Alex Nicoli. I'm not quite sure how to say that. Oh, she says, love you so much. 10 out of 10. You're so good at this. You enlighten me every morning when I turn on your podcast. Oh, thank you so much. I want to thank Bird Molly. That's a cute, cute name. They say, thankful. I am beyond thankful that I have found your podcast. Listening has been such a source of comfort for me. I love listening while on walks. Your podcast has opened my eyes to so much, and I feel like I am understanding myself so much better. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for writing that. That is genuinely what I want. Highly sensitive people, y'all, we were raised by 80% of people that are not highly sensitive. So what that means is that all of us have craved understanding who we are, and we've been looking and seeking and looking and seeking. It brings me so much joy to know that y'all continue to find peace and understanding. That understanding will take you so, so far. When a highly sensitive person understands, they can take on anything. They understand the purpose of what they're doing and they get motivated in life and grounded. I want to thank Falling Asleep. (laughs) That's another cute name. They say, on a whim typed recovering people pleaser in the podcast search bar and found the don't list. Perfect first and fast dose of realism that I felt a desperate urge to get right now. Can't wait to hear the rest. Oh, that was an early episode. That was a lot of fun. We always talk about the do list. Well, you get to have a don't list too. I want to thank Kenzie Wallace 07. Kenzie says, I have been listening for months now. I was seeing, I was seeking out something that I connected with and this was instant. Felt very drawn to you from the moment I heard your voice. Thank you for giving me the motivation to make time for myself and to allow myself to understand my sensitivities more. Very, very welcome, Kenzie. Thank you. I want to thank Mr. Shill 2010. Mr. Shill says, your show on hypervigilance and perfectionism are exactly what I needed to hear today. I literally just broke down crying yesterday, trying to explain to my husband how I have been feeling but not being able to find the word to describe it. Then I heard this podcast and I knew exactly this is it. Thank you for what you do. You are so welcome. Thank you for being out there listening and growing and being on this planet with me, bettering yourself. It gets better and better and better and better. 
All right, I'll read one more. 99 Allison 99 says, life changing. This podcast has helped me discover so many things about myself. It lets me know I'm not alone and it's been a vital tool in my healing journey. I'm a Reiki master and spiritual healer, and this podcast has helped me become a better healer and pass on so much valuable information to my clients. Spirit speaks through you so beautifully and fluently. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for passing on your love and your light. Not just Allison 99, but all of you. When you do this healing, when you get to know yourself, our life feels enriched. This is how we learn to live. None of us were meant to be in this perpetual survival mode. Light and love and living, y'all. I'm an emotional badass. You're an emotional badass. And together we are where Moxie meets Mindful. I will be right here next time with a brand new episode for you right here. Take care. Bye-bye.